So let's begin a discussion on resonance. So first and foremost, this is a subject you saw in Gen Chem, and resonance always indicates the presence of delocalized electrons. Now, that's a word here. You're probably not going to use it in any other context besides resonance, and it means in more than one location. Obviously, this is different than anything in everyday life. We can't be in more than one location, but electrons can. So we draw these resonance structures, and they don't really exist. What really exists is some combination or average of the resonance structures. So if we look here, there's this extra pi bond and it's in this location here, in this location in this structure, and in this location in this resonance structure. The truth, though, is that that extra pi bond is in all three locations at the same time, partially. And so since it's shared in three locations, that's an extra third of a bond, so these would all be one and one-third bonds. So stronger than a single bond, but weaker than a double bond. So the other side of the coin, you'd see that in this structure and this structure, this auction that I'm indicating is negatively charged, but in this one it's not. And so the truth is it really has two-thirds of a negative charge, and we label that by saying partially negative, the little Greek letter delta meaning partial, like as in partial derivatives. Uh, so this is the idea of resonance. It always indicates delocalized electrons. So we draw these resonance structures knowing that they don't really exist. The molecule never looks like any of the resonance structures we, uh, we draw exactly, but it always looks like some average of them we call the resonance hybrid. So let's talk about drawing resonance structures. When we go to draw resonance structures, we need to keep in mind that there's only two sets of electrons we can move in drawing the next resonance structure. And the first are non-bonding electrons. So whether it be a lone pair or a radical. So, and in this case, they have only one place they can go, and they can go to an adjacent bond, no further. So the second type of electron we can move are the pi electrons. And uh, note that pi electrons are only present in double or triple bonds. So and they have an option here. They can move to an adjacent atom, either of the ones they're double, you know, part of the double bond to, so on either side, or they can actually go a little bit further and go to the adjacent bond. Now, one thing we need to keep in mind, though, is that regardless of how you move electrons, you can't move them towards an sp3 hybridized atom. If you did, you'd violate the octet rule for that atom, which is why it's not possible. Let's see how we put this into practice. As we begin to start drawing resonance structures, there's a couple of new pieces of vocabulary that would be very helpful along the way, and those words are allylic and benzylic. So an allylic carbon atom is a carbon atom adjacent to an alkene. So if we look here, an alkene is your carbon double bonded to carbon. So either carbon adjacent to that, and had there been carbons coming off the other side of the alkene, same diff, but no further away. It has to be exactly the carbon directly attached to the carbons of the alkene. Now notice it's not the carbons of the alkenes themselves, those are called vanillic, but one carbon further away, the ones attached, those are the allylic ones. So in likewise, we have these benzylic carbons as well, and they're the carbons attached to a benzene ring. And again, it doesn't include any of the carbons of the benzene ring, but the ones directly attached to the benzene ring. So, and the idea here is that if you look in both cases here, allylic or benzylic, those carbons are one bond away from pi electrons. And we're going to find that nine times out of ten, resonance comes down to being one bond away from pi electrons, and that's why these words are important. So let's go draw some resonance structures. So there are really three major types of uh, molecules or ions that we're going to draw resonance structures for, and the first are what we call carbocations. And it's not a carbocation, it's not like you're on the Atkins diet taking a vacation from carbs or anything, uh, but carbocations, so it's a carbon with a positive charge. So, and if we look, Carbocations are stabilized in one of two situations, and the first is carbocations are stabilized by resonance when located one bond from pi electrons, and again, allylic or benzylic, those two terms we just brought up. So if we look here, we've got a carbocation here, and if you recall, that carbocation means that this carbon doesn't have four bonds, he's only got three, so he's only got one hydrogen. So, and in this case, if he's one bond away from pi electrons, we should expect resonance. And lo and behold, he is one bond away from where these pi electrons are located. So this carbon right here, the carbocation carbon. So as a result, we should expect resonance. Now pi electrons, as you might recall, can move one of a couple different places. They can go to an adjacent atom or an adjacent bond. And our goal in moving these electrons is going to be to get this carbon his fourth bond. That way he won't be positively charged anymore. So we could move these pi electrons to this adjacent atom, but obviously that's not going to get a fourth bond here. We could move them to this adjacent atom, and that's also not going to get us a fourth bond either. So as a result, we're going to just ignore those possibilities in this case, but we can move them to the adjacent bond here, and that will get our carbocation carbon a fourth bond. And so if we look at our structure at that point, so we still have this pi bond over here. 
So we'll now have a pi bond here, and this carbon still having one hydrogen has four bonds and is no longer a carbocation. You'll find that it's this carbon over here, and if you look back here, he's only got the two hydrogens. He's still only got those two hydrogens, so he's only got three bonds, and he is now our carbocation. The question we have to ask ourselves is, is he one bond away from any additional pi electrons now? So when he's one bond away from the pi electrons we just came from, but not from any additional ones, and as a result, we have no further structures to draw. This is our last resonant structure. So our two resonant structures, we put this little double-headed arrow in between them, so, and we can see that it's shared between two carbons. Now one thing to note, if we look from the get-go here, this carbocation was one, two bonds away from these pi electrons, and these will not be involved in the resonance at all. It's got to be exactly one bond away from the pi electrons. So here we've got another carbocation that we should expect resonance for. And first off, our carbocation here is exactly one bond away from these pi electrons and the double bond here. So and being one bond away, according to rule number one, we should definitely expect resonance. We'll see that under rule number two here, carbocations will be stabilized by resonance if an adjacent atom has a lone pair of electrons. And it's not the case now, but it is going to be the case in the future. Uh, but as we saw before, our way of getting this carbon, his fourth bond, so is going to be to move the pi electrons to the adjacent bond. And when we do so, we'll get this new structure here. So we'll now have a pi bond here. This guy's now got four bonds, so he's no longer positive. But this carbon right here lost a bond in the transaction, and so he's now our carbocation. So we have to ask ourselves, according to rule number one, so is he one bond away from any additional pi electrons, a double or triple bond? And the answer is no. He's one bond away from the ones we just moved. And if I move those back, I just get my original structure. So rule number one we're done with, but rule number two here, so we actually have two adjacent atoms that have lone pairs next to him, and we can use them to make another bond. So if we get a, plug those into an adjacent bond, and that's the only place non-bonding electrons are allowed to go, we move those into an adjacent bond, we'll get this carbon, his fourth bond as well. So if we look here, we'll put another double-headed arrow there. So, and now with the nitrogen, we're gonna have a double bond. We're still gonna have this double bond over here, and we're still going to have the bond to the OH, and he's still got his lone pairs. So in this case, if you work it out, this carbon's no longer a carbocation, but if you work it out for nitrogen, nitrogen's now got the positive formal charge. So if you look back here, we actually had the option, we could, if it looks like, used one of the lone pairs on the oxygen and done the same thing, made a bond to the carbocation as well. So it turns out you can't branch off a resonant structure and, you know, kind of Branch it off right here. That doesn't work. So what you're going to have to do, if you want to go back and draw that resonant structure now with the double bond of the oxygen, you're going to have to undo the last resonant structure so and then do what you would have done. So notice the first arrow puts the lone pair back on the nitrogen. It would give us back a carbocation right here. So And then this arrow moves the double bond with the oxygen. So if we look at our last resonant structure we draw here, Nitrogen, again, has got his lone pair back. We still have this pi bond here. But now we have a pi bond to the oxygen. So he's still got two. Oh, oh, he doesn't have two lone pairs. He's just got one lone pair. Let's get rid of that last one. So, and we'll find out now that the oxygen, if you do his uh, calculation for formal charge, we got six minus one, two, three, four, and the bond of the hydrogen is the fifth. So he ends up with his plus one charge. So instead of a carbocation, we now have an oxygen cation. So, but... We no longer have any additional resonant structures we can draw. We're not one bond away from any pi electrons of the carbocation or anything like that. So that was the last structure, and we'll close our resonance brackets here. And so in this case, we've got four resonant structures. So I want to take the time out to talk about something else. So and that's dealing with major versus minor resonance contributors. So and it turns out when you've got a bunch of resonant structures, so your average structure is going to look like some you know, average of all these structures. So in our case, our average structure, in this case, might look Something like this. So we see that we've got a pi bond here sometimes, not in the first structure, but in the other three. So there's really a partial pi bond here. So we see that we've got a pi bond here, but not in the other three. So there's a partial pi bond here. And by the same reason, partial pi bonds between that carbon and nitrogen and this carbon and oxygen as well. So partial pi bonds in lots of locations. We see also that this carbon's positive in this structure, but not in the other. So it's really partially positive. Same thing with this carbon and with the nitrogen 
and with the oxygen. So it turns out that this resonance hybrid here is going to look more like some of these structures than others. We've got to decide who's the best. So when looking at a positive charge, you generally should think, oh, maybe I would want a positive charge on the less electronegative atom. And we'll find out that negative charges typically are more stable on the more electronegative atom. So we'll find that the major resonance contributor is the most stable structure, and it'll be more stable if the less electronegative atom has the positive charge assuming all things are equal. And we're going to find out not all things are equal here. So in this case, the not all things are equal is we see that nitrogen here, when it has the positive charge, and oxygen here, when it has the positive charge, both have a filled octet. And that's a huge advantage to the two structures over here that have the carbon with the positive charge, because those carbons do not have a filled octet. And therefore, the structures with the nitrogen and the oxygen, even though they're more electronegative, are more stable and better resonance contributors. You might also look at it in terms of the number of pi bonds. So when you put electrons into a bond, it lowers their energy. And so in this case, the nitrogen and the oxygen have lone pairs. But in these two structures, one of the two have lost a lone pair and put it into a pi bond. And that lowers the energy of electrons. And by that reasoning, we could say they're better structures as well. So however you want to come to it, either filled octets or more electrons and bonds, uh, having the positive charge on the nitrogen and the oxygen is better than having it on the carbon in this case uh, even though they're more electronegative. But between the nitrogen and oxygen, all things are equal besides electronegativity. And since nitrogen's electro less electronegative, the structure where the nitrogen's got the positive charge is our major resonance contributor. What that means is there's going to be more partial positive charge on the nitrogen than on any other atom in the structure. This overall resonance hybrid looks like this structure more than any of the other four. That's the big deal about major versus minor contributors. The second example of resonance we're going to take a look at here is the resonance stabilization of non-bonding lone pairs of electrons. So in the example we're going to look at here are this pair right here. So I've got a negative formal charge on that carbon, but you don't actually have to have a negative formal charge to have stabilization of non-bonding electrons. So in this case, the big key is that they need to be exactly one bond away from pi electrons and again, allylic or benzylic. So if I look at this carbon, is it exactly one bond away from pi electrons? And indeed it is from the pi electrons in this double bond. This is an allylic carbon. So in this case, typically an allylic carbanion. So and as a result, we should expect resonance. And we're going to get something very analogous to what we saw with the positive charge. And so we're going to draw the structure first here. So we're going to end up with a pi bond here. And we'll end up with the lone pair and a negative charge here. Now, how we get there is not completely intuitive. And that's why I want to draw the structure first. So it looks very similar to what we did with the carbocation in principle. But the movement of electrons is totally different. Now, we're going to start with the non-bonding electrons. The only place they can go is an adjacent bond. That is it. So where do they have the chance of going is only here. They're going to be the pi electrons in that next structure. That's the only place they're allowed to go. So a lot of students want to take the pi electrons from this structure and just move them over to the adjacent bond here. So, and that would get pi electrons in the correct place, but we'd end up with this lone pair that has nowhere to go. We'd violate the octet rule, end up with a positive charge over here. We'd have all sorts of problems. We definitely wouldn't arrive at this structure. So, but if this is all we do is this one arrow, you're going to find that we violate the octet rule for this atom. So he'd have five bonds. So we're going to have to end up moving these pi electrons further away. And to not avoid you know, breaking this guy's octet rule, we're going to move them to the adjacent atom right here. They're going to turn into this lone pair of electrons on that carbon. So if you notice kind of the workflow here is that the lone pair becomes a pi bond, and then the pi bond becomes a lone pair. They kind of trade places, so to speak, obviously in different locations. But again, the key is the lone pair becomes a pi bond. The pi bond becomes a lone pair. So and in this case, we have to ask ourselves a question now is, is the lone pair of electrons one bond away from any other pi electrons? And indeed, it is the double bond of the oxygen in this case. And so we're going to do the same kind of pattern here. We're going to have the lone pair become a pi bond, and we're going to have a pi bond become a lone pair. And we'll get yet another resonant structure in this case. So these pi electrons are still here. So we now have a pi bond here. And now just a single bond to the oxygen, and he picked up a third lone pair. And we'll find out that now this carbon is no longer negative, but the oxygen, 6 minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, has a negative 1 formal charge now. So, And again, we ask yourself, are we one bond away from any additional pi electrons? And the answer is definitely no. And so we've got our last resonance structure here, and we see that the overall resonance hybrids an average of these three again. And we see we've got partial pi bonds here, 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 and here. 
So, and partial negative charge on the oxygen, partial negative charge on this carbon, and a partial negative charge on that carbon. That's our resonance hybrid. So but we can take this a step further and say which of these is the most stable structure, a negative charge on this carbon, negative charge on this carbon, or negative on the oxygen, and the negative charge on the more electronegative oxygen wins hands down. And so this is our major resonance contributor. And so we found out that the partial negative charge on the oxygen is greater than the partial negative charge on either one of the other two carbons. The last example of resonance stabilization we're going to look at is the resonance stabilization of a radical. So, and a radical here is when you have a, a single unpaired electron as we do right here. So, and that single unpaired electron is what we refer to as the radical. And so when you hear people say, oh, free radicals are so dangerous, and they are. They're highly reactive. They react with your DNA, leading to mutations and all sorts of other problems uh, associated. So, uh, but anyhow, so they can also be involved in resonance. And in this case, again, only when they're located one bond from pi electrons, again, either being allylic or benzylic. And so in this case, we're exactly one bond away from our pi electrons over here, the double bond. So we should expect resonance. And yet again, the arrow pushing, though, is going to be very different than what we've seen. So in here, we're going to have some funky stuff going on. But we might be able to predict what our resonance structure looks like here. The double bond, the pi bond is going to be here. And now that radical is going to be on that carbon. So and that's the only one we're going to have. And so again, being allylic or benzylic is the only example of resonance stabilization where you're really going to have to concern ourselves with. Uh, and this is the least important of the three different examples of resonance, so FYI. Uh, but we will visit it again to probably towards the end of the first semester. Uh, but the arrow pushing here. So we've got a non-bonding electron here, and the only place a non-bonding electron is allowed to go is to an adjacent bond. That's it. And I see that in this location, I have a pi bond in the next structure. So we're going to move it there. But when you move one electron at a time, you're going to find that you only use an arrow with half a head. So uh, everything we've been doing up till now has showed two-headed arrows, and that's always for the movement of two electrons. But here you've got to be careful. It has to be a half-headed arrow. So and in this case, to get the other half of the pi bond in the next structure, the double bond here, this pi bond is going to have to break in half. Half of it goes to form the other half of that pi bond, and the other half forms the radical out here, so on the outside carbon. So And that's the movement of electrons here. So even the pi bond splits in half with one electron going one way, one electron going the other way. And this is the very funky arrow pushing involved with radicals. So and again, it's the least important now. I'm not saying it can't show up on an exam this time of the year or something like that, uh, but definitely gets much more important towards the end of the semester. This is something we'll deal with in mechanisms uh, towards the end of the first semester.